Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Mominel. Hi, good to see you guys. Um, Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, to begin with this session, uh, it's, it's, it's been my honor to, uh, to be a chair of this session uh, in this conference, uh, which is very prestigious for me because it is organized in the honor of uh, Bangladesh's 50th independence anniversary. So I'm really proud of being a part of this conference. Um, before I continue, before I go to the main presentation, I would like to introduce myself. I am Momunul Hassan. I'm from Bangladesh, currently a PhD student here at uh, University of Flensburg, and also proudly the first Bangladeshi staff of Soul Share in Bangladesh. So, the, and also from that point of view, I'm also very proud to be here today uh, with my um, with my co-author um, Kentaro Takeno uh, with our paper together, and um, uh, just to begin with the with the topic. Uh, here we have today uh, battery swapping and e-mobility uh, for this session. So um, just to start with the word, like um, the, like in they saying in Germany, uh, Energiewende, which we are all popular, we are all familiar with. Also, there's one thing called Verkehrswende, like transportation transition. Uh, in a bigger perspective of energy system, both of this technology, both of these concepts are coupled together. So it's, it's kind of sector coupling. So we are coupling uh, transportation sector to the energy sector, energy sector with the sustainable energy. At the same time, we also need to think about innovation, which is, I think, the most talked uh, topic in the in the conference, entire conference from the beginning of this conference. I have the feeling like we have to innovate and we do not, if we do not innovate, innovation find it, finds its own way. For example, here in Germany, here in Europe, in America, uh, governments are pushing uh, to promote electric vehicle through different policies and different instruments, different incentives. In our countries, in, in Bangladesh, in India, it, is, it has proliferated without any incentives. You know, so it is the demand. This is why I say, like, uh, if we do not innovate, innovate find innovation finds its own way, and that shows us, okay, you guys need to do these things. Uh, with this opening uh, uh, opening word about the electric vehicle, uh, electric vehicle in our uh, in our countries in global south, especially, I would like to um, hand over the the the, the uh, hand over the mic to. Nikhil Aurora to find uh, to to present his uh, work. Uh, uh, he is from uh, he is from Hochschule um, Anhalt, and I think he is also doing his master thesis right now. And I'm also happy to see him here because we also met him. Uh, I also met him a couple of months ago in in November, I believe, in in another conference in 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 organized by MES as well. So Nikhil Aurora, over to you. Thank you so much, Mominil, for your starting remarks. And I think it's it's perfect ground for starting the presentations now. And uh, I'll directly jump into it and quickly share my screen. So I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Perfect. So. Um, as you already introduced, my name again, Nikhil Arura, and I am a master student at Hochschule Anhalt. So um, in, in English, it's uh, Anhalt University of Applied Sciences. And I am right now, uh, I have started recently my master thesis. So it's in coordination with my university and Microenergy International. So uh, the topic on which I'm researching on is uh, um, try to figure out or propose an algorithm which can um, which can optimally uh, charge uh, the PV based uh, battery swapping stations. So it's an optimal charging strategy for uh, PV based battery swapping stations. And uh, before I jump into the presentation, I would like to maybe give an overview on what uh, vehicle fleets we are tar targeting so that everybody in the attendees and audience uh, are on the same page. So um, if I talk about specifically for India and countries like Bangladesh and uh, 
to some extent in Africa. So we have uh, three wheeler electric vehicles which are being used as passenger vehicles or as commercial vehicle so with passenger vehicle i mean so it it helps in last mile connectivity for um traveling to short distances and commercial you can you can uh, think of uh transporting some uh goods from one place to another so this uh research not only focuses on these three-wheeler vehicles but also on two wheelers uh which can be used in delivery purposes for you know online shopping and stuff so um if uh so now i would like to Nikhil, just yeah. to interrupt you you are your your presenters view are here not presentation view okay okay um Wait a second. You can swap the display when you do um, with the go for the um, presentation. Yeah, click swap the display. I think that will solve your problem. Okay, now it's fine. Yes. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. So, um, uh, if I get into the objectives now, so I would um, uh, say that the objective of this research would be to figure out some optimized operation to improve the service ability of battery swapping station. So, by service ability, I mean if uh, if uh, if a vehicle owner is coming at a swapping station to swap. Uh, his uh, uncharged battery. So the batteries, the charge battery should be available as fast as possible. So I'm trying to um, improve this serviceability and as the swapping station would be PV based, so it would automatically re also reduce the charging dependence on the grid power. So just to give a quick overview on how the stations look like. Um, so these are the two kinds of stations. Mostly they are modular based. And if you have higher capacities of swapping, so uh, you can just uh, uh, plug them together and it increase the capacity. So it can differ in the, in, the, in the shape of the batteries. It depends on the manufacturer of the vehicles, what batteries they are using. So accordingly, they are uh, modified. So the problem statement which I'm trying to solve here is that the current um, practice in the uh, battery swapping industry is that individual chargers for each of uh, the battery is being used in the battery uh, swapping compartment. So if you see at this slide, there are different compartments for each battery. So when I, when I mean different chargers, so it means that if the battery has individual charger, uh, to get a charge. So what I'm trying to do uh, here is uh, do it with a single charger. So it will bring down the cost of the system. So this research can uh, turn to be a stepping stone in, in, the, in the shifting of industry of uh, this PV based battery swapping stations, which uses only single chargers. And uh, it also reduces the cost of the system as I said. So, um, the main aim is to allocate the chaotic PV power. So we know the PV power is changing at all the times of the day. So the main aim is how we manage this changing PV power and charge these four to five batteries in, in, in the um, charging platform with a single charger. So that is a challenge I'm trying to solve. So the system here, which I'm considering is quite simple. Uh, it's just an off-grid uh, solar PV system with the charge controller and battery swapping platform. So usually the battery uh, swapping platform and charge controller are clubbed together in the same uh, module. So, um, and and it's it's actually the research is majorly focuses on only the proposed algorithm. So I'm just keeping the off-grid and battery swapping sides uh, a bit simpler. So. The methodology I'm using is uh, uh, to get first the input data for 
figuring out um, the energy generation from the off-grid power plant. And uh, for the input data, I'm using solar radiation, the ambient temperature by which I will be finding out the temperature on the module and the wind speed. And the last one will be the uh, load profile, which is the battery itself. So um, I chose these parameters because if we look at the standard test conditions when the module is being tested in indoors or laboratories. So these are the three major parameters which are being used. So I also uh, decided to stick to these two, three parameters. And the second uh, uh, step would be using the PV model to find out um, the generation from the off-grid uh, plant using the input parameters from the first step. And third one would be uh, using a battery model significant, uh, specifically only for lithium ion batteries. So I'm assuming here that all the vehicles are being charged using lithium ion batteries. So um, the uh, next step would be proposing an algorithm for this charge controller, which will make the decision making, uh, which will do the decision making uh, to allocate the PV power. So. Um, and in the end, I will uh, try to simulate the algorithm and hold of the system for different uh, configurations. So the models which are uh, which I am planning to use here for the off grid, if if I consider only for the PV system to get the inputs, um, I'm using the clear sky model. So. Um, before I get into this models, I would just quickly tell, I mean, the, I'm, I'm using Python as this, uh, the simulation tool and designing tool. So in Python, we have a very interesting and vast library for that is called PVLib. So from that library, I am um, uh, using, uh, try to get this input parameters. Uh, so the clear sky model is, uh, actually there are a lot of models available in clear sky section. So specific which one I am using is Inaition and Paris model. So which is the most famous one. And um, so the clear sky, the name itself says that no cloudiness or any, uh, any kind of um, disruption in the radiation is being considered in this model. The second input parameter is the ambient temperature and the, the third one will be the wind speed. So we have in Python individual modules for these two um, parameters. And uh, if we go on the extreme right, the battery sharpening thing, I'm using the lithium ion model uh, and uh, there is a specific model for that uh, only for lithium ion batteries. So it considers the charging uh, strategy and also the how the battery will deplete over its lifetime. So the proposed algorithm, which, I'm, the, which is the main objective of this research will be for the charge controller uh, and will be plugged in in the middle. So um, now how the decision making will be done and that's the main question. So uh, how the charge controller will decide which battery to charge because there, there will be a lot of incoming batteries and uh, uh, it, the, it, the charge controller needs some reference to uh, you know, take the decision. So, so uh, this algorithm will be uh, taking its decision on based, uh, on based on the state of charge of the incoming batteries. So whenever the vehicle owner um, swaps the battery, so the um, charge controller interprets the uh, state of charge of the incoming battery, the discharge one. So the main aim of the charge controller would be to take the charge of discharge batteries to the cutoff uh, uh, SOC, which is um, at this, which is, uh, I mean, the cutoff is the, SOC, which is at which the battery is considered charged. So it can be any, any value, 90%, 95%. So, and um, taking the decision, uh, how it will decide once it gets the incoming SOC of the batteries would depend on, uh, for example, if you see in the right figure, the green, the bigger one is the fully charged one. And these four we have, uh, assumingly that uh, discharge batteries just came in. So. 
the the state of charge of the incoming battery which is closest to the cutoff will be charged first so if you can see here the uh, battery with higher soc will be charged first because uh, because remember the main aim of the research is to increase the service ability so that customers can um, swap the batteries as soon as possible and the the battery with higher um, incoming soc uh, will be actually the one which will get faster uh, fast charged uh, till the cutoff value so this is how the um, um the, the, the this algorithm and charge controller takes the decision on which battery to charge uh, just so, to just to interrupt uh, you might uh, make it shorter a little bit so that you can finish it earlier okay 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 yeah. really quick yeah so there are a couple of assumptions which i took in this model so um the clear sky one which i already explained and i'm assuming no cloudiness nothing so it's all clear um, and uh, enough pv power is available to charge at least one battery and the vehicles are powered for by lithium ion batteries only and the uh, next one would be the state of charge of the batteries is known in real time so it's a tricky task but i am assuming that is it's available in real time to take the decision so um and the next one would be the charger is connected to one battery or a set of batteries with same soc so um the by this i mean the set of batteries means it can be possible that two or more batteries have same soc like incoming soc so the charger gets connected to all the uh, batteries in parallel so it starts charging on the basis of that and um, the the battery uh, which will be assumed charge is the cutoff value of ic which is considered uh, fully charged so just an example for the simulation scenario um systems specs uh i would be it, it's just an example so i would be taking one case uh system specs as 10 kilowatt rooftop pv and um, with the 30 degree tilt angle and i'm assuming that there are five uh, batteries in the uh, uh swapping station and then the cutoff value which has to be reached by each and of every battery is 90 percent and i'm simulating for each season of the year so it's summer autumn winter and spring and the battery temperature is kept constant at all times and the case one which uh, i am taking into consideration that all the batteries have different initial soc's so on the basis of that how the algorithm will react and the case two would be if assumingly the two batteries have same soc's how the algorithm will react to it so this is i guess the last slide of my presentation so the search question which i'm trying to look for is uh, could a pv based uh, swapping station could be the future of charging um, for micro mobility and reduce the national load. And um, the other thing which I'm really curious about can the charging strategy play an important role in improving the swapping ability? So, and uh, can this algorithm which I'm uh, working on be a um, I mean, uh, this algorithm, which is using only single charger to chain uh, to charge all the batteries in, in the station can be a game changer or not. So I, I strongly believe that it is quite possible. And I, I believe that the answer to all the questions would be yes at the end of the result. And yeah, so this was it. And thank you for your attention. And I'm open, open for discussion now. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice presentation. Brilliant. Um, so I I am one of the discussion, a discussant of your paper uh, in this um, uh, in this presentation. So I would like to ask you, um, like there are some um, battery swapping stations already in place in India. Mm -hmm. um, so Unlike Bangladesh, India is quite pretty advanced in this sector because there are already existing battery swapping stations. Did you manage to collect some uh, ground ground data, like how this is performing over there in India? 
and uh, how you can take lessons from them and improve your model. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's the thing which I explained in my problem statement is that in the current scenario, specifically in India, the swapping stations are actually powered by grid, first of all. And the second thing is, um, as I told that every battery has individual charger to charge. So these are the two things which are which is the ground reality presently in India. And this, this, the third thing I would say, there are not so many battery swapping stations. If I, if I talk about in North India, but in South India, yeah, there are specific, uh, some significant amount available. But yes, uh, so this is the problem which I'm trying to solve of um, that why they are connected to the grid, why not uh, we have the sustainable source of energy, why not solar or wind. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Also, also from the, I mean, was, my question is from like from battery management point of view, not only from the energy point of view, mm -hmm. also from battery management point of view, how battery management is taking place in this battery swapping station, uh, because if you look at battery swapping compared to uh, plug in charging to the battery swapping station, major advantage is you can implement battery management. So, uh, which is which is really difficult uh, to individual uh, e-rickshaw drivers uh, to implement that, even though they don't know the concept of battery management. So, the, my, my my major point of um, asking the question was like how battery management is stay, is uh, is taking place in this battery swapping station uh, for for example for improving the life of battery battery uh, battery with the e-rickshaw. Um. I would say I am not so aware about the battery management system because it also depends on what system, I mean, the, the control system in the battery being used by the manufacturer. So it varies, it varies actually from the manufacturer to manufacturer, but um, the, the, the battery uh, swapping stations which are available in India, so they are mostly for lithium ion batteries and for lithium ion batteries, uh, most of the manufacturers set a value of 20% of the, uh, DOD, the depth of discharge. So they are allowed to discharge only till the 20% uh, of uh, charge capacity of the battery. And at that point of time, uh, the, the driver has to uh, swap the battery to get a new one. So yeah, that, that's the thing I'm aware of right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I, I need to ask um, another question about, um, uh, do you have a specific place in mind uh, to for this uh, technology, uh, what you are doing research? Mm, no, I, I mean, the, the algorithm can fit to any place, but if you want to see the demand and if you want to go into business perspective, then I would say it would be better to go in the countries like Bangladesh, which are actually using these vehicles and also India, there are huge number of vehicles flying on the road already. So there is no need to create demand for these vehicles, but the demand is for these swapping, I mean, swapping or charging stations, uh, which is quite lacking. So I would actually um, prefer to imply, uh, apply it in India and the countries like Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any um, any other question from the from the from the panel? There are some questions in the Q and A. Um, do you want to deal with them, or should I read them aloud? Yeah, I saw the I, I saw the first question. Thank you, Lucas. I saw the first question. Um, why Tesla swapping technique in their supercharging station was failed in two thousand sixteen? Well. Okay, so I'm actually not aware that this technique was failed, but I mean, <laughs> I don't have any idea about this, uh, this thing. Maybe it can be possible that Tesla, I mean, they are making uh, passenger vehicles, so they have a huge battery bank and it's, it's quite a significant effort to swap the battery. I mean, the vehicles which we are targeting is having, I mean, they are having battery size of four kilowatt hours and it's a small battery and it can be um, swapped using i mean the driver only i mean he can he himself can do it so swapping a battery for a passenger vehicle it's it's a great task so that could be one reason i guess 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nikhil. I think this question is still, uh, I, I, I also don't know the exact answer of this uh, Tesla, Tesla super swap, super uh, supercharging station. Um, station. Um, I, one of the, uh, I will, I think this could be, this could leave us a question, research question to us as well why this model didn't work for Tesla and why it might work in Bangladesh or India. So this could be a research question uh, in our research because, uh, because definitely technology is not, uh, is, is not for every, some technology is not for every, all the places. So what we can do, uh, we, can, we, can, we can customize, we can, we can take lessons from this, uh, from these swapping stations, uh, international swapping stations and what, can be done better than that, these stations to uh, to go for a wider application in our countries. So this could be. I would leave this leave this as a research question uh, for our research as well. And the next question um, is: What is the lifetime of those batteries? Mm, it it actually depends on how you are using it, charging and discharging it, but. I would say it's around, so for lead acid batteries, which is currently being used in, I would say in 80 to 90% of the vehicles, it's around somewhere around less than one year because the usage is quite high. I mean, they are, they are, they are operate, these vehicles are operating every day, day and night. So that's why it's quite low for lithium ion battery. If the battery charging and discharging is quite controlled, then I would say it can be around three, three to four years. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Nikhil. So uh, one of the, the I would, would to add to Nikhil, I would also say from Bangladesh point of view, like um, the, the, the the on an average battery runs for. Uh, one year and in some cases for six to four to six months as well. I think uh, Mohan Raj uh, also had some answer on this aspect. He raised his hand. No, he, yeah. I uh, just wanted to contribute to the presentation. First of all, it's an interesting presentation, Nikhil, and I just want to share my experience. So I was working in a delivery uh, company called Lifrand, which delivers food. So they use bicycles, like electric bicycles. They use batteries in it. So uh, whenever I go in there and then you know, pick up a bicycle, went for a delivery and then comes back when the state of charge is like pretty low. And then I have to wait for a long period of time to swap it because they are using, you know, unique charges for every batteries. So um, I think this uh, method or model that Nikhil proposes is very, uh, has a huge potential, especially also in developing countries such as India and Bangladesh. Um, also, one of uh, I have to need to clarify one question to Nikhil. So you said um, the batteries will charge depending upon the state of charge, right? Uh, so my question is, if if there are two batteries with the one say like the state of charge is eighty percent, another say the state of charge is fifty percent, um, which one um, charges first? So um, like they do they charge simultaneously or they um, charge the first? battery with the state of charges about 80 percent so uh, i would say that we will the the the, uh, the charge controller will charge the one with 80 percent soc because it is quite it will take lesser time to reach at the cutoff maybe if it is uh, at 90 percent let's say the cutoff uh, so the battery with 80 percent soc will take lesser time because it just has to charge more 10 percent and the 50 person will be charged next. So yeah, the charge controller is only one. So it can be okay. connected to only one battery at a ah. time. Yeah. Okay. So it's like a queue process. Mm -hmm. One yeah. battery ch yeah. charges first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your discussion. I don't see any other question. If, uh, if audience have any question, please raise your hand or write the question in the Q and A. Um, I, um, we, that will be very much appreciated. So with this, um, with this, uh, um, with this last question, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, Nikhil, once again for your presentation, and I would like to invite Kentaro Takeno um, for his presentation about uh, his presentation, which is uh, which is electric rickshaw battery swapping state battery swapping business model for fostering energy transition in developing countries. 
So that's to talk about uh, Kentaro. Kentaro is a Japanese citizen uh, doing his, uh, he was doing a master in uh, ESCP business school in Paris. Uh, so he also did his master thesis in, uh, in, 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 in electric rickshaw, especially targeting the countries like Bangladesh and India. So Kentaro, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mominilo, and then also interesting presentation, uh, Nikhil. So Kentaro uh, from WCP, let me share my screen. Here, do you see it? Yes, clear. Great, so thanks uh, everyone. And it is an honor to share my presentation today with you. So uh, first, let me start by sharing how I came to start working on this subject. Um, it was uh, because of my visit to Bangladesh two years ago that surprised me a lot in many aspects. Among many things such as culture, economy, nature and everything, the most surprising thing was the electrification of the rickshaws. So rickshaws. Uh, most notably to me, the name of rickshaw sounds Japanese and that actually comes from Japanese. Literally translated in Japanese, it means human powered vehicle. But nowadays we do not see it in Japan or in Europe. Uh, in Bangladesh, however, and in other in, in other southeastern Asian countries, uh, they are uh, very much uh, uh, widely used. It is the main public uh, transportation means. So, what was more surprising to me, however, was that now they have become EV. So they were and still uh, rapidly shifting to motors and batteries uh, from uh, human power or combustion engines. Now, after moving to France. As I continued my studies, uh, my, to my father's surprise, uh, I learned that e rickshaws are more dominant uh, on the earth than electric cars. What it means is that total number of e rickshaws, such as in India, Bangladesh, exceeds uh, that of the EV cars in China, US, and altogether of the rest. Considering the economy uh, in the region is rapidly growing, and uh, as are the demands and supplies of uh, the mobility, most notably the e rickshaw, and uh, the e-rickshaw market and the impact to society, to the economy is already big. And without doubt, they will be even bigger. So that is why I started working on this research topic about the e-rickshaw. In this uh, research, we especially worked on the battery swapping and coupling it uh, with the solar power to propose uh, new business models. So uh, this work is actually a collaboration with Bomi uh, today here um, facilitating us uh, from Bangladesh, from, uh, now in Flensburg University, and myself, uh, Kentaro from Japan in USF Business School in France. Uh, and we met last year, um, around November, December, and then figured out that we could work together on this subject. So, and to frame our research in another word, it aims to couple the two sectors to propose new models. One is the transportation transition, uh, that is the increase of the EV, especially the EV shares in the regions. And the other is the energy transition happening in the solar power sector. So uh, next. Uh, so the e rickshaw market is a growing sector in emerging countries in South and Southeast Asian countries, such as India and Bangladesh. So uh, the table on the left shows the constant and steep increase of the EV penetration in which especially the three wheelers, namely the EV shares, stays the highest penetration among the EV transportation vehicles in India. On the right, the chart shows an example from a Bangladeshi town called Rangpur, where EV share accounts for the majority of the transportation means. This supports the electric uh, EV shares popularity in the towns in Bangladesh. And also the increase of the EV share requires additional power generation. So solar is a promising source. So why solar? Solar power is the other pillar we focused because this is a critical point uh, to face the increase of the uh, e rickshaws that calls for more electricity in the grid. So this increase is due to the combined factors of the uh, shift from the conventional rickshaws uh, switching and then using uh, conventional rickshaws that now uses the combustible engines, but switching to battery powered e rickshaws. And also there's another reason that the pure increase of the e rickshaw newly start running on the street because it's cheaper, that fills the uh, natural uh, market growth. So the situation leads to a uh, shortage of the electricity. So the solution to this problem is solar power. 
The table on the left shows the next 10 years, the increase of the power demand will be mostly full, fulfilled by the solar power in India. And uh, on the right, you can see in Bangladesh, similarly, solar is the major power source among the renewable energies, thanks to the abundance of the sunlight throughout the year. So this quickly evolving e rickshaw market uh, presents the possibilities of new technological applications, namely the combination of the battery swapping and the solar powered charging stations. There are roughly two types. Uh, one is uh, on-grid types uh, in the urban areas. The other is off-grid types in the rural areas. Here, unlike the previous presentation, we will talk about the on-grid situation in the urban context. There are several models. Um, so the most complex situation is uh, the grid connected battery swapping station as community battery energy storage uh, with uh, solar power combined. And then this combines the swappable batteries and solar power to optimize the grid stability while maximizing the other economic parameters. So the our approach to this uh, topic. So in this paper, we explain the e rickshaw market opportunity comparing the financial indicators of battery swapping stations and energy storage for renewable energy integrations. So the four different drawings indicate four different business cases. The differences uh, with the previous presentation is that ours are connected to the grid. So for the status quo on the top left, uh, this is an existing charging station model. This does not use the battery swapping nor the solar power. This is already in the market and is proven to be profitable. The scenario one below is the battery swapping charging station model. The only difference here is the introduction of the battery swapping model. The charging station business operator owns the swappable batteries. The e rickshaw drivers, on the other hand, do not have to buy the battery, but uh, pay for the use of the battery and its electricity. So for the scenario two, this is the battery swapping charging station and battery energy storage system. So this model is based on the scenario one, but special in its relation to the grid. Here, the charging station owner can release the electricity back to the grid. This allows for the grid stability and more revenue models for the charging station owner. The scenario three, the last one on the bottom right, is the community battery energy storage system uh, that we looked at earlier. This model is the most complex one, and this includes all that we saw and also the solar power generation. Obviously, the solar power generation helps charging the battery, and also the swappable battery as means of storage can bring stability to the grid. So the, this, this research uh, uses three methods, like interview, academic journal research, to gather input data, and business model development for solution uh, simulations. So for journal research, we looked at the various EV precedents with the useful input data, but uh, we didn't necessarily find uh, uh, very great information either, uh, especially uh, regarding the mixture battery swapping and also solar power. So uh, we also had the opportunity to conduct some interviews uh, with uh, to get the insights and the input, input data from local authorities, uh, allowing a more case specific information. And all this combined, uh, we developed the business model and uh, conduct the simulations for different scenarios. So the various available input information enables the detailed development of the different models and the scenarios leading to key financial indicators that we want to evaluate here. So one input is the economic input, uh, such as fin financing capital, inflation rate, uh, discount rate. And then the other, for example, is the CapEx input, including uh, equipment, land, and batteries. And uh, also the OPEX input, uh, such as uh, electricity, human resources, uh, battery replacement. And all this uh, leads to the um, net present value or internal rate of return or return on investment. So let's look at the four different cases here now. First, uh, it is the status quo, uh, meaning the existing charging station model. Uh, this is a model that already exists in Bangladesh or basically anywhere where there is e rickshaw. The advantage of it is that the power supply is stable, at least uh, as much as the grid. Of course, uh, if grid fails, uh, the power supply fails as well. The drawbacks are, first, the uh, time it takes to charge, during which the drivers cannot work uh, for about eight to 10 hours. And then second, uh, illegal businesses uh, use the unauthorized household tar tariff that is cheaper. And uh, third, uh, it's the lack of the battery management. Uh, 
So battery management here uh, means the optimal charging cycle that maximizes the battery lifetime. And the business model implication here is that this is already in, in there in the market and is proven to be uh, profitable. So the next, uh, this is the scenario one. So this uses the battery swapping method. And we will consider both the lead acid and the lithium ion batteries. Because um, in Bangladesh, lithium ion will take time to become the market leader. And in the meantime, now lead acid battery is prevalent. So however, we need to consider the development of lithium ion battery as it was mentioned in India case as well, and uh, other areas outside of Bangladesh. So that the model here is broadly applicable to different situations. So the change it brings to the status quo is the swappable batteries that is owned and charged by the charging station owners and swapped as needed by the drivers. So the benefit will be first, uh, firstly, it, will, uh, it still uses the power supply. So it is basically stable. And secondly, it's an uh, optimally controlled uh, charging method. And this can reduce the charging cost, help the grid stability and keep the battery performance and prolong its life. And thirdly, the battery ownership does not belong to the driver. So this means that the, the initial investment by the e-rickshaw drivers to start the business will be about 25 to 50% lower, which will definitely encourage the increase of the new entrants to uh, start the, this business in the market. And fourth, this is environmentally friendly too, because uh, of its uh, prolonged battery life, and also because you can recycle the battery after its uh, like, uh, used life. And um, well, the, this model contributes to the circular economy as a whole. So because the charging station owner owns the batteries and uh, they can easily properly take care of the used batteries following uh, regulatory requirements and taking advantages of the available incentives. And like now, now uninformed the individual drivers randomly dispose of the batteries. So it's not good for the environment uh, at present, but it will be better if it's handled by the owners uh, as uh, in a centralized manner. So other advantages include uh, saving the space because it's, uh, uh, the rickshaws do not have to be parked while it's charged. And also the drivers can continue to operate at night by just simply swapping the battery while now they tend to stop to working at night and charge the rickshaws overnight. So the downsides are the technological adaptations of the battery and higher investment by the charging station owner. And the business model implication is that the indication of the profitability according to the various input data, as well as the expected positive financial indicators. The second scenario is the combination of the battery swapping charging station model, what we just saw now. And also um, what's new here is the battery energy storage system. So the beauty of it, especially because it's connected to the grid is that this will allow for the voltage compensation to the local grid which eventually will bring more balance to the grid. The downside of this is that it requires the regulatory acceptance to sell the generated electricity back to the grid, and also it requires technological development. Also to achieve the financial benefit from balancing the grid, you have to negotiate with the grid operator. And the business model implication here is that this model enables selling ancillary services uh, that will add revenue sources to the owners. So the last scenario, the third one, is all that we've talked about and also the solar power. So um, it will be used as the community battery energy storage. So the advantages are all of what we've talked and the newly added solar power generation that is uh, going to be also a storage of energy, as well as uh, uh, bringing the local grid stability and then compensation of the solar generation uh, to the solar generation instability. So the downside of it is that the profitability of the rooftop solar, uh, which is partly subject to the government policy, as well as the current lack of ancillary service frameworks in the policy. And the business model implication is that it has all the advantages of the previous two scenarios. And further, this model offers energy selling, especially during the peak time in the community. So to conclude, we looked at this one, uh, one status quo scenario, which is existent in the market, and three different models. 
So as you could see, this research focuses on sector coupling and takes advantage of the transition, transportation transition in the e-rickshaw and also the energy transition taking place in the solar power sector. So this analysis of the new business models leads to further investigation to identify the ideal conditions to achieve profitable models for other areas. And especially this research aims to guide the policymakers and help them think about the benefits of coupling the e-rickshaw transportation and energy transition and uh, in the solar in developing countries. And by doing so aims to attract potential investors in these areas. And furthermore, this analysis opens up the possibility to use the same method in similar countries such as Nepal, India, and support discussions for upcoming transitions. So that is the presentation from me, and thank you very much. So I will open up the stage for everyone. Thank you. Th thank you, Kentaro, for, uh, for nice presentation with the story uh, you have from Bangladesh. So uh, I, I, I think it is uh, like you, what I have seen in the, in the whole conference from, from the beginning, from the opening session, so many people coming to Bangladesh to visit the innovations in Bangladesh. Is it the things like people coming uh, to see, not only to see e-rickshaws and also solar home systems, but also they're coming to see how we provide, fight with basic, uh, basic needs. For example, how we are fighting with uh, transportation demand, how we are fighting with our energy poverty, how we are fi fighting with basic poverty as well. So this is amazing that uh, we can actually yeah, we can actually uh, start a school of innovation here so that we, we instead of visiting like people go to Dubai to see buildings and go to Thailand to see beaches and people come to Bangladesh to see solar panels and, and things. So this is amazing that we can still we can start a sustainable innovation tourism in Bangladesh. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go for the discussion. Um, for this discussion, uh, Nikhil, you have questions, particular questions? Uh, to um to us actually <laughs> yeah yeah sure i i have a few questions so first i would just uh summarize like what i understood from Quintero's uh presentation that this research will be mainly fo focused on battery swapping and what benefit it can create for the vehicle owners and that is quite clear that they can swap in few minutes and second is incorporating solar into the grid would actually reduce the load from the grid, and uh, it's 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 a benefit for Discom. So, um, in this slide, then number ten, you have uh, mentioned that there are some, yeah, in your cons, you have mentioned like there are some illegal businesses using unauthorized household tariffs. So, I want to know if it's also a problem in Bangladesh because it's it's in India uh, that there are illegal businesses which are not even paying household tariffs to charge these uh, vehicles. They are stealing the electricity. So that's a major concern for discoms. So is it also the case in Bangladesh? And how, if yes, uh, how you are planning to maybe figure out a way through your business model research? Uh, thank you for your uh, questions. And first, about the confirmation part, that uh, it's mostly swapping and uh, also the renewables. I mean, the solar. Y yes, the three scenarios are about uh, like two scenarios are swapping, and then one scenario has the renewables. But uh, this uh, by having these swappable batteries uh, will enable uh, and benefit introduction of the solar panels and the solar power. So. Well, I'd say it's not uh, really only about swapping, but the combination of that. That's why I kept saying the coupling the two uh, transitions in, in transportation and energy. So that's the answer to the first uh, confirmation. And then second, unauthorized uh, um, the charging. Yes, in Bangladesh as well, uh, there are uh, the cases according to the interviews that we've conducted with the local authorities and they acknowledge it. And uh, to answer in this research, uh, we are not really touching how to solve the problem of, of the unauthorized uh, charging. Um, that could be done by like smart meters or uh, different uh, ways like uh, licenses and such, but uh, that's more uh, like a governmental um, 
I think, policies and regulations uh, uh, up to them. And uh, what I would, however, uh, like to stress here is that authorized um, charging stations are making profit as well. So, like, of, of course, it, they are compliant to the tariff that is uh, more expensive than the uh, unauthorized, like, household private tariff. They they properly pay the official rate, and yet still they do make business and run it uh, with profits. So that's the interesting insight that we've got to know. And uh, yeah, with that, I think it's hopeful that the, the, the industry will switch to the off only the official market because it still makes uh, profit. Thanks a lot for your answer. And I, I just, this question came to my mind because um, before I started my research, so I had an interview with the DISCOM. So it, it was, of course, in Indian DISCOM. So they were actually preferring to solve this problem maybe through some business model, which can benefit the people who are actually stealing the electricity. So if they see some benefit of uh, coupling this, um, this solar powered swapping stations and also the grid. So I guess it would be easier to, um, to, to shift them from stealing to doing it officially. So that was one of uh, the thing which came up in uh, this discussion. So, but anyways, uh, I have also one, one more question in the next slide, I would say. So, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So here, um, yeah, in your prose, the second one, you talked about reduced charging costs, okay, and increased grid, grid stability. So I was just wondering that this case, which is being considered, is has a unidirectional flow of power. So how the battery swapping station can provide grid stability, I, I, I just wanted to know that. I, th I think I can uh, so, jump in here. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, go to this next slide, Kentaro. Um, um, next slide, where it's bidirectional. So the thing is, um, the, uh, this is, as you know, this is a continuation of my first paper. And the, the second paper is about making business model. First paper was about showing the concept, how it might work. And uh, where I showed like, Battery, we have renewable energy, uh, especially solar in the daytime. And we, if we want to charge the battery from solar, we need to charge it in a day, but which is directly coupled with the time, with the, uh, with the working hour of people, you know, the same time conflicting. So what was my proposition was to stay, delay the charging, de delay the delivery of the battery, swapping the battery by 24, by next day. So today I will charge the battery and battery will go to the driver tomorrow. So it is a time delay, time shift. There is a time shift uh, between these two, two event. As long as, since the battery is in, the battery is staying in the charging station. So it has the ability to focus to, uh, not only for charging, but also if grid needs support for supporting at that time. If the, the, I, I showed a whole uh, cycle, for example, if you, uh, the Kenter uh, also put that slide as well here, the whole cycle, for example, in the daytime, in the morning, the battery is coming here. And then, uh, yeah, here, the, this, uh, the, the, uh, this, the, the, this picture, for example, in the morning, Battery uh, electric rickshaw is coming here and uh, and changing the battery. So they leave the discharge battery in the swapping station, and then batteries started being charged from the grid. If the solar is there, then battery will charge. Otherwise, otherwise it will not charge. So what will what it will do? It will wait for the late night tariff to charge. So we are not putting pressure on grid. So we are putting pressure um, on the grid when the grid does not have pressure and grid also wants to release some uh, 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 dumps of power at night to keep the best power station on. So this is the concept. So um, the main concept of batteries is staying in the charging station. It has the ability to uh, provide sufficient support to the grid if grid according to the capacity of the, of the power electronics it has. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got. I got my answers. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much, Mohinder. You're and, welcome. And I also have a, a question from the um, from the uh, uh, from the audience as well. So the second uh, second scenario, 
Uh, so the question is how uh, how the how the, the insect in scenario how is the value of battery energy storage system calculated and priced so here uh, is the i also i also would like to answer this question here in the price so currently in current um, uh, current time horizon we do not have uh, we do not have the like, regulatory for regulatory the uh, regulatory law or um, or any provisions for uh, quantifying the ancillary services from uh, from this kind of entity for example battery battery um, energy storage entity but uh, considering the solar progress in bangladesh the solar energy energy penetration we consider we are looking at the future uh, future so if there, if there is too much solar coming in the grid, we need support. So based on that, we will definitely have to have this kind of policy that if someone's coming, like 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 the presentation you saw me for Mrs. Shakila, is that uh, the uh, that uh, the the power plants are coming to give uh, give uh, give supports during the peak load of the of the demand, and they are charging too much money for that only for that particular moment because government need power at that time so government is bound to pay whatever they ask for so if solar is going that high go, uh, the, the the distribution system operator will also look for solution how they can handle this kind of situation this is actually the case is having is in many places so people so government stop giving permission for solar new solar as well so, because they don't have that kind of infrastructure to give the uh, give, provide sufficient support to the grid for the fluctuation of the power. So, if we have this kind of solution in the beginning, so we are actually killing the problem in the beginning. So we can we can go together with these things. So, this is the question. We do not have priced, but uh, but we can value it based on the based on the current practices in other countries as well how this power uh, is is quantified um, from BESs because there are many Ronald Berger has business model there are many business model in this case uh, we can take prices um, and keep it as a as an example Bangladesh, for Bangladesh and the second question uh, coming from um, Sebastian also <laughs> it's a very interesting question uh, uh, thank you Sebastian uh, thank you Raluca as well for your first question uh, so the question is uh, what are the incentives for rickshaw garage owner to switch from the status quo it is always change the attitude attitude people's attitude on something that is already working and profitable this is extremely uh, the uh, extremely good question uh, Sebastian, uh, I would like to thank you for this uh, for this question. Uh, what is the what is the uh, uh, current practice? Definitely, we 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 saw that many uh, many cis, many charging stations are not are not um, uh, legal, and there are mix of legal and illegal solutions. So government needs to be, be needs to be active in this case. Uh, for two purpose, like one purpose for making it legal and the other purpose of uh, reducing the uh, battery dumping uh, to the uh, to the nature uh, to the um, to the nature like illegal battery dumping or like how it is being ended up in a scrap material store. So we uh, from this aspect and we, we the government need to chip in and definitely battery swapping station. Battery swapping. If if you can make it, if you can show it, it is more profitable than the uh, than the existing practice. Definitely, we can uh, create some sort of momentum to have this uh, to to uh, to bring this uh, a thing in in practice. Um, uh, we this is why we are going for this research that we will find the business feasibility here, and then we can actually answer the question to you perfectly uh, that why. We are looking for this, and um, and to for the and Ralukas has a follow up answer, follow up question also for my CPPA. Uh, I am interested in calculating value of ancillary service. Thank you, Raluca. We can work together. <laughs> let's uh, let's do it together. How we can uh, quantify these uh, ancillary services? So I think we are taking too much, too long time. Um, I would like to um, invite uh, Mohan Raj Ramados to 
present his work, which is, um, which is circularity business model in energy access, focus on reverse logistic of lithium ion batteries using resolve model. So uh, Mohan Raz is a research intern at Microenergy International. Um, so I, um, so I warmly welcome you to, for, with your presentation. So floor is yours. Oh, Mohan. Thanks, thanks, Moimul. Thanks, Moimul, for the introduction. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone, and good evening, depending upon where you join. Um, yeah, I'll share my screen. All right. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yeah. So today's topic is circularity business models in energy access. Focus on reverse logistics of lithium ion batteries using Resolve model proposed by Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So um, to give a bit of background uh, of the presentation, we are going to see what are the current system of uh, uh, model which are following this linear economy. What are the challenges with respect to linear economy? How, how are we going to address the challenges uh, with respect to consumer electronics and automotive batteries? And uh, how can circularity business model can you know uh, give give a solution for the uh, current challenges that are that are pro, that are in the linear system of uh, um, the linear economy model? So uh, to give a bit of a background, I will start with a story. Um, in the past six months, I have broken a couple of my smartphones. And the first time I broke, I purchased through a second-hand shop. And other time when I broke, I couldn't find anything in the second-hand shop, so which are expensive. And uh, I, I tried to repair, but it was also expensive in Berlin, especially uh, in Berlin, there is this culture of, you know, um, giving up stuff for free or exchanging stuff for free for like furniture books electronics you can get it easily but then for mobile phone it's a bit hard maybe due to privacy reasons and i i also couldn't find any um shops to repair and repair is so expensive so i ended up buying a new mobile phone uh, why i'm saying is i'm i'm currently left with two mobile phones which which i couldn't do anything about it so i i kind of did a research on this and uh, Created a survey and then at the survey, one of the key points from the survey, it's like about more than 60% in the setting in uh, Berlin as you know, still have their old mobile phone, which are still can be used, but they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, so what OIM is uh, stating the story is to produce a smartphone, you need at least uh, 278 kilowatt hour to produce and about 1000 liters of water to produce a smartphone. So it's it's inappropriate to just you know um, uh, to we have to it's important that we have to take use of the residual value that is still in the uh, used mobile phones uh, in the uh, in the bottleneck of the current uh, linear economy model. So we we take this uh, we purchase it online we use it for a couple of hours and it becomes fixed. And these are the uh, disadvantages of the current system. Uh, it requires a lot of energy and water to produce. Of smartphone and it's even harder to repair and because of which is waste is accumulator and uh, um, in the process of which we are you, you, we are in a situation of the the critical resources which are used in the mobile phone such as uh, for example lithium that are used to make batteries or or you know uh, cannot be uh, recycled and which means uh, there's a scarcity of the resources so that's once again uh, to reiterate we take in raw materials we make we put in energy and labor to make the uh, product and then we consume and once we consume it just becomes waste so we have to close this loop in order to you know reduce waste reduce pollution to maximize the uh, utilization of the product and then to make uh, to make products from the recycled uh, materials to in order to uh, make more sustainable products. These are the current problems with respect to linear economy. Um, according to the circular economic calculation, our world is only 8.6% circular, which is really, really uh, 
scary because uh, in a we are in a situation that uh, to uh, realize the Paris uh, Agreement, we have to put in more effort to be more sustainable and circular economy is the one of the key factors in order to attain uh, our realized Paris uh, Agreement. And uh, one, uh, one of the problem of the current system is waste accumulation. Uh, as, as we all know, plastic pollution is a major threat. About 8 million tons of plastics base escapes into the ocean, and uh, it is estimated that about 100 tons of plastics in the world are around the world. It's and one other problem of filling a current system of modulus energy consumption uh, in order to extract new materials from the uh, OS, it requires a lot of lots of energy and water. And there is another economic disadvantage because if, if, you, if you are dependent on some certain certain materials that are scarce and uh, the flight price fluctuation of the raw material can um, make it difficult for the companies to focus the price. And also to, in order to, when we just keep on extracting new materials, it's may, it makes a critical material scarce. And on the result is we, we can only use materials for a certain period of time. And solution to all of this is we have to design out based on pollution, extend the product life, keep the materials in the loop and eliminate the raw material extraction. So that's when circular economy or circular system of business model comes into place. So in the case of a uh, mobile phone, which I addressed previously, for example, if, if there is a uh, situation where I can go and purchase to a retail shop or an online seller, where, where he offers a repurchase guarantee, uh, such as uh, external producer responsibility, I can use a mobile phone for a couple of years. And then when it became, you know, uh, when the display are damaged or the battery is damaged, I can just go back to the, back to the uh, retailer and then give back the mobile phone and then I can get a new mobile mobile phone back what this uh, uh, addresses is uh, the producer gets back the gets back the used mobile phone um, from which the, he can actually extract uh, resources from the old mobile and also the uh, model of using a um, product as a service instead of owning a, your mobile phone uh, it gives a lot of Flexibility for the as a user uh, to exchange uh, old mobile for to uh, in order to get a new one. In my case, I don't have had two two of my used mobile phones. If this this is the case, and also it uh, uh, uses recycled materials to remanufacture. That way, it prevents um, you know extracting uh, new materials from the environment. And when it comes to automotive batteries, it's about. 140 million, the number of electric vehicles to be predicted on the road by 2030, and about 11 million of uh, lithium ion batteries are expected to reach end of life of the service between now and 2030 because it's 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 an era of electric vehicles and we see a steep rise in uh, number of electric, electric vehicles across the globe, especially Tesla recently launched its uh, uh, production uh, in India, and uh, we all know. How, what is the situation in India? I mean, it's it's the demand is going to be uh, rising all the time. And the worst part is there's only less than five percent of the lithium-ion batteries that are, are recycled currently. What this means is there are still a lot of lithium-ion batteries available, or uh, they they haven't uh, just dumped into the landfills. And since this uh, lithium-ion con uh, contains materials such as Lithium, cobalt, and nickel, which which are very harmful for the environment when when it left unhandled, and this has to be uh, taken care uh, in order to reduce reduce the pollution and also to minimize the raw material extraction. And current issue with the automotive battery and e-mobility are, uh, as we all know, that more than eighty percent of the rechargeable batteries are used in electric mobility, and it's projected to be increased. And the current demand of the lithium ion batteries is 213 gigawatt hour and is projected to increase more than 10 times, about 15 59 gigawatt hour by 2030. So I will explain the current value chain of lithium ion batteries in this schematic. Uh, so the mining happens where they extract lithium, cobalt, or nickel, which are used to produce lithium ion batteries, and then goes into manufacturing facility where they can make a different type of lithium ion batteries 
LCO or NMC, LCO is lithium cobalt oxide, and NMC is lithium nickel magnesium uh, cobalt oxide. And then it goes into uh, uh, a complete finished product, and the consumer uses it. In the case of electric vehicles, uh, it can be a battery pack, or in terms of consumer electronics, it can be a small lithium ion battery. And, uh, it, and then when the consumer uses it for a couple of years in terms of consumer electronics, so 10, 15 years in terms of electric vehicles, it goes to the um, induced management. Uh, the problem here is sorting. Uh, because we, also, we just saw that the um, percentage of lithium ion batteries that recycle is only 5%. The main reason uh, for this difficulty is because of the sorting. Um, because we, we just saw that lithium ion batteries have two different types. So it's difficult for the uh, companies to sort for these uh, batteries and also to identify what is the state of the battery. And also it requires so much of investment to uh, run a lithium ion battery facility. Um, and it's, it also requires a lot of stringent measures to eliminate the pollution coming out of the lithium ion battery. So, there are so much of bottlenecks in this area. And also, even when it's recycled, the economics is a concern. Because the cost of extracting um, um, minerals from the nature is cheaper at the moment when it compared to the reverse logistics or recycled products. So this economics has to be um, incentivized in a way that the recycled products or the recycled value of the uh, um, lithium, cobalt, or nickel should be lesser than the one which are, which are which we extract uh, from the natural resources. Um, this has to be done using incentives. And one major problems of raw material extraction is, uh, this is the chart uh, for uh, lithium, where we can see the, um, the biggest production, producer of lithium is Australia, and the biggest consumer of lithium is China. And this graph gives up about the uh, because producer of uh, nickel, we can see it's widely um, distributed. Uh, but in case of cobalt, the highest producer is the uh, Republic of Congo. Uh, more than 60% of 70% uh, of the lithium comes from one specific country. Uh, this creates a lot of dependency on the country. As well as we, we all know there are several politics involved, child labor issues and uh, um, not environmentally sound. Uh, system, uh, systems are introduced to extract the raw materials in uh, Republic of Congo. So uh, it is uh, important that we have to distribute the uh, source of uh, um, materials. One of one such uh, aspect is to recycle the materials that we have right now, so that we the dependency of extracting new materials will be reduced. Also, there are researchers undergoing in this area that to replace uh, cobalt as the cathode source in lithium ion batteries so that we eliminate the dependency with respect to one country here. Yeah. And that's when circular economy is very important, you know, not only to eliminate waste, but to minimize the uh, extraction of new materials from the environment, uh, and, and also to realize Paris Agreement or um, climate, neutral, uh, climate neutral policy of EU, uh, because the global greenhouse emissions in five key areas, key areas such as steel, cement, plastics, aluminum, food, were found to be fallen by 9.3 billion tons a year when, when, we, when we follow circular economy pathway. And circular business models use already existing materials, which reduce the dependen dependency on uh, extracting new materials. Uh, one uh, best way to explain a circular economy or circular economic model is to uh, there's a system in Germany called PFAN system where uh, you, you go to a stab, you, you, you go to a shop, you get a, a carbonated drink in a plastic bottle. You have to deposit a certain amount of uh, uh, amount before you buy. And then once you return the uh, bottle, you get back to the refund. So we have to create such a system in the, uh, such a system in a way that uh, induces or get or get getting in, incentivized in order to give back the um, product they use. Uh, these are the important things to be considered in a circular economy. It should be implemented in every aspect of the value chain, right from the design uh, 
to the end life management uh, also it is uh, important that, that we have to create a product that are designed to last and it should be more modular uh, even when it's uh, um, defect the repairing process should be easier for the end user so we have to implement circularity in every aspect of the value chain um, in this and we can implement we can design a products that are uh, design uh, products are built to last and can be a uh, design a product that are modular and in terms of manufacturing you, you can use recycled products to manufacture that way you again lessen the dependent dependency on extractor uh, uh, newly extracted materials and in terms of uh, retail distribution uh, you can reduce uh, or you can eliminate the ownership model and then um, lend the product as a service um, and in terms of uh, when you when you uh, consume finish consume the product you can actually extend the uh, lifetime of the product by introducing repair recover recycle and try to extend the product life of the uh, system and once if if you, you can't repair or reuse or recycle you can um, actually uh, follow environmentally sound management of uh, disposing of the product and how opportunity here is as i say the world is only 6.8.6% secular hence there's a huge opportunity of of about 91% to make the transition from linear to secular economy um also applying circularity economic principles could unlock about 1.8 trillion of value of europe's economy and as i said it should be uh, it's important that the circularity principle should apply in every aspect of the value chain and it is important that this particular knowledge has to be transfer uh right from the consumers suppliers and infrastructure has to be developed in order to realize circular economy uh because a lot of people when when they are given an opportunity to um let's say uh, in my case if i have a, have an opportunity to exchange my smartphone with a retail shop i wouldn't have bought a new one so there has, there has to be regulation in place and awareness about the circular economy uh, has to be um, given out to the public so it's because they they are often um, resistant to change and these are some uh, examples of business model innovation in terms of circularity um, we are we are a little bit short of time if you can conclude uh, fast i mean yeah sure. okay. just take another minute yeah so for example solar uh, transform the leftover potato into biopolymers and uh, uh there's an interesting mobile manufacturer called Fafone they use recycled products to produce uh, uh smartphones and it's easier to repair as well and the chinese car maker rio has introduced battery as a service which uh, it actually reduces the cost of a, a car by about 30% if you're uh, if you're renting a battery rather than uh, buying it and the met methodology which i are uh, going to use to um used to uh, create case studies resolve model which it, it is uh, prepared by ellen macarthur foundation uh, so resolve is regenerate share optimize loop visualize and exchange so my plan is to create case studies with respect to these uh, uh, resolve model so one such uh, example is in terms of visualize everledger is a company uses blockchain which creates qr code to help identify the state of battery so it's important whether to uh, whether if the battery can be refurbished or recycled um so my plan is to conduct a literature review and uh, prepare case studies with respect to resolve model and measure the circularity and prof profitability of reverse logistics whether if it's profitable or not and provide recommendation to uh, transition um, into circular economy from linear and these are the tips if you can follow if you are still if you are in berlin uh you can already use free your stuff to give away your stuff or used by uh, used goods and uh, i fixed it is a, a interesting platform where you can repair your mobile phones they provide uh, manuals and also sell uh, uh these products which can, you can repair your phone by yourself and right to repair movement is gaining popularity it recently francis um uh, introduce this policy as a mand mandated this policy for all the electronics uh, goods they have to provide a repair index such a way that the product is repairable or not so these are something which we can uh, use which to 
to transition quickly into a circular economy. And these are the references which you can follow. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohan. Thank you. Very interesting presentation about um, circularity of the business model, circularity of, uh, um, of uh, energy storage, especially batteries. Um, so I let me look, have a look if there is a question from the audience. Um, yeah, uh, so far I don't see any question, but the question is uh, to, to discuss with your topic. A um, couple of years ago, I came across with a company called Umicore. Maybe you have heard about this because uh, Umicore is one of the company who started, um, uh, re renewable, who started smartphone uh, material recovery. So, mm -hmm. So, uh, so, but uh, the thing is, uh, Umicore, uh, the main problem Umicore was um, having for um, for collecting smartphone for recycling, or not only battery but also material. Um, the thing is, uh, people um, the, the the too much collection cost. So, uh -huh. collection cost is very high. So, how they would like to collect, uh, how they collect it, and they go for recycling, and also. The, the other problem is um, other problem is the, if the if for smartphone I'm just talking about smartphone now then I come to battery the other problem was about um, uh, I you said that you have three smartphone or four smartphone and we if we open our drawer we will find our many smartphone True. You know? so the major connection with this material recovery or battery or dying things like this there's a one of the major reason is emotional connection of exactly. these electronic devices for example i i for example this was my a phone given my by my girlfriend you know so i i would like to keep it i don't want to lose it or Very my true. father or my uncle even though it is not i'm not using it i'm not I, i'm not i keep it with emotional connection so this is one of the reason that these things are not traveling to the recycling center or upcycling center or the material recovery center. So for, for battery case, it could be different completely because you cannot keep it. Battery is also explosive and it also not, uh, people also started understanding these things that even if I have a smartphone, I should uh, somehow try to get the battery out because it might, uh, it might have some negative consequences. So this is the awareness we need to, uh, spread to the people maybe to collect the batteries of smartphone or, or also for electric vehicle. So one of the model can be followed uh, from our countries, you know, so in our countries here in Germany, if you go to the street, especially at the end of the month, you will see like many things are there as a spare mole, yes. mole, you know. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, these things you don't see in Bangladesh or India. And be, because in Bangladesh or India, most things are valuable. If you don't, you can only see some useless trash in the street, but no, you don't see any valuable sure. thing. And not a piece of wood. We take it and we burn it, we cook our food. But here case is different in, 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 in things because they have um, higher co opportunity cost to do, to do these things. But in our country, it is completely different. In, we can we can apply this model in, in, in this kind of thing in our in, in recycling things like every material is is precious you know sure. something like this every material is precious and we uh, and we we need to reveal the whole chain if we are buying one uh, buying a lead acid battery or whatever lithium ion battery we need to uncover the whole chain how how many how many people in 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 Congo, is is become home, homeless, you know. So this the whole ch chain, this that the whole journey of the. If you um, if you look at the cradle to cradle analysis, like in sure. currently cradle to grave, cradle to cradle um, cradle analysis, then we need to recover the whole chain to raise the awareness of recycling of circular economy. Exactly. Yeah. Very valuable insights, Monimur. Yeah, uh, of course, it's it's not going to be changed. For, for example, I, I always believe business model has the potential to change or transition. I mean, there there can be lots of research. There can be lots of lots of research papers presented, but then it's, it's the business model that actually realizes what's in the research. Uh, then, and for for to business for for business to uh, perform, they 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 one of the key factors they see is profitability. 
So if they see some material to extract which is cheaper than recycling, they of course they go to you know take a extract new material. So there has to be stringent policies or incentive for those companies to you know use secondhand or recycled materials into the manufacturing system instead of extracting from the um, mm -hmm. minerals. Exactly. Uh, one thing is uh, one thing is if you. Uh, another thing is if you want to do something unsustainable, I mean, definitely for making profit, the, the path is easy. If you want to do something sustainable, the path is not easy. True. This first thing comes like uh, it's economically not viable in the current time horizon. And second thing is like ignorance of people. Okay, we it's like the same issue as climate change. It's not emergency. Sure. <laughs> people yeah. consider it as an emergency. If as long as we don't we do not consider it as emergency, people don't have the sense that we have to do it. True. Something I think like uh, EU or Germany found that EU in general have this policy of uh, you know becoming climate neutral by 2050. So part of which is to is the right to repair movement, which I talked about. So they are going to mandate the smartphone makers or electronic makers to have a repair index or create products which are easier to repair and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I think the regulation is, is an important thing to, to make for transition from DNA to secular economy. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And this is a big topic in Europe now, like uh, EIT raw material is working uh, quite a lot on this to, um, to recover this, uh, to, 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 uh, for, for this uh, implementing circular economy. So I hope um, I hope you will come up with a, with the, with your resolve model with with uh, with some great outcome. And we I am looking very much forward to seeing your uh, seeing your uh, re research outcome. So sure. I wish you good luck. And I would also like to uh, say thank you to the participants and audience and the panelists as well. Um, uh, and I. I also wish the successful last session of this conference, uh, not, not this one, this is the second last and uh, next session and um, successful end of this conference.